Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. Did you hear that sound? That was an ICBM rocket lifting off to its intended target. Not a great sound and horrifying, to say the least. Our main story tracks such a missile, but was it launched by humans or aliens? Also, we have your stories that include two museum ghosts and one angel visitation. So, if you're ready, here is our five minute mystery. Another five minute mystery. This five minute mystery is being brought to you by the X Bar Dude Ranch, located where the rolling Texas Hill Country meets the romantic vistas of West Texas. The X Bar Ranch is a nature retreat that truly is one of a kind. Slade. Oh, yeah, Sheriff. What can I do for you? Seems there's been some excitement out at the X Bar Dude Ranch. One of them dude vacations at Des Sequoia. Okay, Sheriff. I'll meet you out there in about a half an hour. Right. Well, here's the Sheriff now. Hiya, Sheriff. Howdy, Dan. Having some trouble out here? Yeah, I reckon it's not going to be any too good for my business either. One of the guests up and got herself killed. Where's the body, Dan? All oh, right in the house here. A fella named Vaughn Calder. That's her husband. He's inside with her. Oh, hey, it's Hardy, Mr. Calder. It's Sheriff Slade in the corner. How do you do, gentlemen? Hate to bother you like this, Mr. Calder. We'll just have to ask a couple of questions. Well, go right ahead, Sheriff. It, well, I'm rather broken up, but I'll try to be of some help. Vaughn. Vaughn, I just heard. I'm so terribly sorry. But maybe it's for the... Oh, I didn't know that. That's all right, Nora. This is Sheriff Slade in the corner. This is Nora Bradley, gentlemen. Any relation Howdy, to man. you, Mr. Calder? Why, no, we're going to be married, that's all. Yeah, then I reckon you and your wife weren't hitting it off so well. There's no use my hiding anything. We weren't hitting it off. She'd known about Nora and me for some time now. I'd asked her a dozen times for a divorce. She wouldn't give it to me. But I wouldn't have had anything like this happen. I didn't hate her. How did she die, Mr. Calder? She was bitten by a rattlesnake. You can see the little hole in her arm. Will you take a look at the body, Carner? Sure. Go on, Mr. Calder. We were out riding this morning. We'd gotten off the horses to rest for a while. I had my back turned to her for a few moments as I tied the horses to a tree. I heard her scream. I turned around, and there was a large rattlesnake a few feet away from her, poised to strike. I saw the fang shoot out from its mouth and plunge into her arm. It was horrible. Then what happened? Well, we were only ten minutes from the ranch. I got her back here as fast as I could. She was dead when I arrived. What's your report, Carter? Everything's as he says, Sheriff. Small puncture in the left forearm, accompanied by large swelling of the surrounding tissue. She died of rattlesnake poison, all right. But not by a rattlesnake. I don't get you, Sheriff. You've had a murder on your ranch. Vaughn Calder murdered his wife. Have you found the clues that led the sheriff to accuse Vaughn Calder of murder? The solution in a moment, but first... Something isn't right. I have a feeling that the murderer dude at the X-Bar Dude Ranch is missing some herpetology information. Unless, of course, the snake has a dental condition known as infectious stomatitis. This mystery is being brought to you by the X-Bar Dude Ranch. The land around you is yours to experience. And now, back to our story. What are you trying to do? The coroner just told you she died of rattlesnake poison. There's no doubt about that, Calder. But it weren't administered by a rattlesnake. You injected poisonous venom into your wife's arm with a hypodermic needle. Then watched her die a slow, painful death. And like most people, you don't know much about snakes, Calder. That evil-looking thing that the snake shoots from its mouth is not a fang. That's just the tongue. Every snake has that. Poisonous or non-poisonous. But the real fangs. And I said fangs, plural. 
are two long teeth in the forward part of the mouth, which are never seen. If she'd been bitten by a real rattler, she'd have two punctures instead of one. Infectious stomatitis is a condition in snakes where their teeth rot. This could be a problem for our detective. What if the snake had one of its fangs rot? I'm just saying that there is room for reasonable doubt. Okay? This 5-Minute Mystery was brought to you by the x Dude Ranch, Texas's best-kept secret. sent in by you, for you. Our first comes from Buffalo, New York. Karen, use the story submission page at ronsamazingstories.com to send in her tale. She calls her story Invisible Friends at an Old Hospital. Here is Karen's story. I'd like to start off by saying how much I love your podcast. It's one of the best out there. Thank you so much for doing it every week. It makes my workday go by faster. Enough with the chit-chat. Here is my story. I used to volunteer at an old historic hospital here in western New York area, and as you may have figured, there are some invisible people that hang around the building. One day I came in early to get ready for one of the tours. It had been raining really hard that day, and I had to walk through what seemed like a pond to get to the building. Due to it being a Saturday, the construction workers were not on site, therefore I was the only one there for a few hours. I let myself in after swimming through the water, unlocked the doors, and made sure everything was in order for that day's tour. I then get comfortable by the volunteer entrance and waited for the docent to get there. The entrance was in the back of the building. You had to climb up this really cool staircase to get to where we meet the visitors as they arrived. After a few minutes of waiting, I heard the downstairs door open, then some wet footsteps coming up. I'm like, yay, he's here! So, when it sounded like he was right at the door beside me, I opened it up to greet him. But all I saw were wet footsteps that stopped right in front of the door. I thought, have I lost my mind? Then I reasoned maybe the footsteps could have been mine. But I was in the building long enough for them to dry. Puzzling, to be sure. That's one of my little stories I've collected while I volunteered there. Thank you, Karen H. Well, thank you, Karen. That was creepy. I agree, it's unlikely that they were your footprints after that much time had passed. Now, I had to look up what a docent was. It turns out that that is a person who acts as a guide or a teacher on a voluntary basis. I didn't know that. Thank you again, Karen. Our second story also comes from a museum, this time from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and was sent in via email by Richard. On this one, I did some additional research that should make you say, wow. But first, I will read Richard's story. He writes, hello, Ron. I know how you love stories from New Mexico. I'm a longtime resident and have had my share of strange happenings. If you want, I'll share more of them with the podcast. I do love the show, and I wanted to contribute this one. I am a handyman by trade and was hired to make some repairs on a home in Santa Fe. I arrived on a Monday to find out that it was actually a gallery of some sort. 
the Andrew Smith Gallery. It's open only on weekends, so I had the house to myself as I worked. I was to repair a staircase banister that no one seemed to know how it got broken. I was on the second day of work when I heard a loud crash from right behind me. I turned, and there was nothing there. Everything was in perfect order and could not have made any sort of noise. I went around the house looking for the source and came up empty. The entire time I wandered around the home, I felt as if I was being watched. I finished up the work for that day and spoke to the curator that had hired me. She told me that I had met the ghost resident of the home. They call him Andy Jr. I found out later that the house was known to be haunted by a little boy who had died there, falling from the banister. That's my story, and thank you for letting me tell it. Richard well, Richard, that is an amazing story. I did some research, and I found this on the Santa Fe tourism site, Author Unknown. Just a few steps off the Santa Fe Historic Plaza sits the Andrew Smith Gallery. The house was originally built in 1905 by a couple that was new to Santa Fe. Unfortunately for the young couple, after they built their new home, a sickly son was born who required constant attention. To make matters worse, the woman's husband died shortly thereafter. The young mother soon remarried. Over the years, the child's health continued to get worse, and the mother threw herself into caring for the young boy. Visitors to the home heard the young boy crying and banging on the walls up of his upstairs room while his mother was downstairs visiting. Confined to a wheelchair, the boy was said to have rolled too close to the stairway, tumbling down, wheelchair and all, to the landing below. The child finally died of his ailments, and the couple moved away. Afterwards, when the house was empty, neighbors would often report seeing lights in the upstairs room that had belonged to the boy. Today, the house has been converted into the Andrew Smith Gallery. How about that for some collaboration to your story, Richard? I want to thank the official Santa Fe website for providing that information. You can visit their website at www.santafe.org. Also, there you will find more strange stories about the city. To Richard I say, thank you, sir. Our third story comes from home, literally and figuratively. In honor of Mother's Day, I share this story written by Yvonne, originally from Minnesota. Yvonne is not the name I associate with her. You see, I've always called her Mom. She wrote this story for the podcast, and I'm proud to read it for you now. My mom is 92 years old on May 18th. Mom writes... The year was 1971. My dad was a retired pastor when this story occurred. Retired is just a word as far as he was concerned. Instead of relaxing to a simple lifestyle, he became the pastor for congregations who were either waiting to find a replacement or theirs was ill. In fact, he had just recently returned from one in Arizona where he had served for six months. That's hard work for a retired man. He and my mom were planning to move to Hudson, New York. He would become the pastor of a congregation there for who knows how long. I was totally against it. He was quite ill and walking was almost impossible. However, he insisted. The furniture they needed had already been sent, so I took them to the train where they would move across the country from Washington State to New York. The picture of them leaving is a memory I will never forget. Mom was wrestling with two suitcases, and Dad was carrying a small box. I've always wondered what was in that box. Probably his cigars. He did like his cigars. When they arrived in New York, they knew they had to get to the airport to take a plane to Hudson. They thought that there would be a bus provided, but the girl at the desk said it would be up to them. She pointed to a glass door where they could get a taxi. 
They headed out and saw hundreds of taxis and thousands of people all looking for a ride. How are we ever going to get one of those taxis, Mom said as she dragged the suitcases outside. Dad still was hanging on to that little box. All of a sudden, two young men came to where they were standing. We'll take care of that for you, they said. One of the men picked up the suitcases. The other took my dad's arm. They brought them to a place where there was only one taxi waiting, and it all seemed quiet. The man helped Dad into the back seat, and the other took care of the suitcases. Mom turned to thank those young men, but they were not to be found. Anywhere. She looked up and down the street and saw nothing except taxis and people getting into them. Where were the young men? My mom has always said that they were angels to aid them in a very tough time. I don't know what happened. They did arrive in Hudson and my dad took over the church. It would be his last because he would pass away a few months later. He is buried in Hudson, New York, and my mom returned to Washington State to live out the rest of her days. Yvonne Well, Yvonne, I want to thank you for that story. I've heard it many times. It always boggles my mind each time it gets told. I had the pleasure of hearing my grandmother tell it, and to me it only reminds us how simple life can be if we let it. After all, the birds of the field get taken care of every day. Who does that, do you think? To my mom, I say, Happy Mother's Day, and thank you for sharing your story. As read by Amazing Stories, read by Amazing People. This time on As Read By, we have a science fiction short story called The Answer, written by H. Beam Piper. It made its first appearance in Fantastic Universe. When you listen to this story, you might think it's a modern tale, surely written in our time. However, it takes place in 1984, 15 years after a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union devastated the entire northern hemisphere of the planet Earth. When was it really written? It's hard to believe that it was actually written in 1959. In fact, Piper had died in 1969, several years before this tale's impending doom. Please enjoy The Answer, read for us by Mark Nelson. For a moment, after the screen door snapped and wakened him, Lee Richardson sat breathless and motionless, his eyes still closed, trying desperately to cling to the dream and print it upon his conscious memory before it faded. "'Are you there, Lee?' he heard Alexis Pitov's voice. "'Yes, I'm here.' "'What time is it?' he asked, and then added, "'I fell asleep. I was dreaming.' It was all right. He was going to be able to remember. He could still see the slim woman with the graying blonde hair, playing with the little dachshund among the new-fallen leaves on the lawn. He was glad they'd both been in this dream together. These dream glimpses were all he'd had for the last fifteen years— and they were too precious to lose. He opened his eyes. The Russian was sitting just outside the light from the open door of the bungalow, lighting a cigarette. For a moment he could see the blocky, high-cheeked face, now pouched and wrinkled, and then the flame went out and there was only the red coal glowing in the darkness. He closed his eyes again, and the dream picture came back to him, the woman catching the little dog and raising her head as though to speak to him. "'Plenty of time yet?' Pitoff was speaking German instead of Spanish, as they always did between themselves. "'They're still counting down from minus three hours. I just phoned the launching site for a jeep. Eugenio's been there ever since dinner. They say he's running around like a cat looking for a place to have her first litter of kittens.' He chuckled. 
this would be something new for Eugenio Galvez, for which he could be thankful. "'I hope the generators don't develop any last-second bugs,' he said. "'We'll only be a mile and a half away, and that'll be too close to fifty kilos of negamatter if the field collapses.' "'It'll be all right,' Pitov assured him. "'The bugs have all been chased out years ago.' Not out of those generators in the rocket. They're new. He fumbled in his coat pocket for his pipe and tobacco. I never thought I'd run another nuclear bomb test as long as I lived. Lee! Pitoff was shocked. You mustn't call it that. It isn't that at all. It's purely a scientific experiment. Wasn't that all any of them were? We made lots of experiments like this, back before 1969. The memories of all those other tests, each ending in an Everest-high mushroom column, rose in his mind. And the end result, the United States and the Soviet Union blasted to rubble, a whole hemisphere pushed back into the Dark Ages, a quarter of a billion dead. Including a slim woman with graying blonde hair and a little red dog and a girl from Odessa whom Alexis Pitoff had been going to marry. Forgive me, Alexis, I just couldn't help remembering. I suppose it's this shot we're going to make tonight. It's so much like the other ones before— he hesitated slightly— before the Auburn bomb. There, he'd come out and said it. In all the years they'd worked together at the Instituto Argentina de Ciencia Física, that had been unmentioned between them. The families of hanged cutthroats avoid mention of ropes and knives. He thumbed the old-fashioned American lighter and held it to his pipe. Across the veranda, in the darkness, he knew that Pitoff was looking intently at him. "'You've been thinking about that lately, haven't you?' the Russian asked, and then timidly, "'Was that what you were dreaming of?' Oh, no, thank heaven. I think about it, too, always. I suppose... He seemed relieved now that it had been brought out into the open and could be discussed. You saw it fall, didn't you? That's right. From about thirty miles away. A little closer than we'll be to this shot tonight. I was in charge of the investigation at Auburn. Until we had New York and Washington and Detroit and Mobile and San Francisco to worry about. Then what had happened to Auburn wasn't important any more. We were trying to get evidence to lay before the United Nations. We kept at it for about twelve hours after the United Nations had ceased to exist. I could never understand about that, Lee. I don't know what the truth is. I probably never shall. But I know that my government did not launch that missile. During the first days after yours began coming in, I talked to people who had been in the Kremlin at the time. One had been in the presence of Klezenko himself when the news of your bombardment arrived. He said that Klezenko was absolutely stunned. We always believed that your government decided upon a preventive surprise attack and picked out a town, Auburn, New York, that had been hit by one of our first retaliation missiles and claimed that it had been hit first. He shook his head. Auburn was hit an hour before the first American missile was launched. I know that to be a fact. We could never understand why you launched just that one, and no more until ours began landing on you, why you threw away the advantage of surprise and priority of attack. Because we didn't do it, Lee! The Russian's voice trembled with earnestness. You believe me when I tell you that? Yes, I believe you. After all that happened, and all that you and I, and the people you worked with, and the people I worked with, and your government and mine have been guilty of, it would be a waste of breath for either of us to try to lie to the other about what happened fifteen years ago. He drew slowly on his pipe. But who launched it, then? It had to be launched by somebody. "'Don't you think I've been tormenting myself with that question for the last fifteen years?' Pitov demanded. "'You know, there were people inside the Soviet Union, not many, 
and they kept themselves well hidden, who were dedicated to the overthrow of the Soviet regime. They, or some of them, might have thought that the devastation of both our countries and the obliteration of civilization in the Northern Hemisphere would be a cheap price to pay for the ending of the rule of the Communist Party. Could they have built an ICBM with a thermonuclear warhead in secret? he asked. There were also fanatical nationalist groups in Europe, both sides of the Iron Curtain, who might have thought our mutual destruction would be worth the risks involved. There was China and India. If your country and mine wiped each other out, they could go back to the old ways and the old traditions. Or Japan, or the Muslim states. In the end, they all went down with us. But what criminal ever expects to fall? We have too many suspects, and the trail's too cold, Alexis. That rocket wouldn't have had to have been launched anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. For instance, our friends here in the Argentine have been doing very well by themselves since El Coloso del Norte went down. And there were the Australians, picking themselves up bargains in real estate in the East Indies at gunpoint. And there were the Boers, trekking north again, in tanks instead of ox wagons. And Brazil, with a not-too-implausible pretender to the Braganza throne, calling itself the Portuguese Empire and looking eastward. And to complete the picture, here were Professor Dr. Lee Richardson and Comrade Professor Alexis Petrovich Pitov, getting ready to test a missile with a matter-annihilation warhead. No, this thing just wasn't a weapon. A jeep came around the corner, lighting the dark roadway between the bungalows, its radio on and counting down. Twenty-two minutes. Twenty-one fifty-nine. Fifty-eight. Fifty-seven. It came to a stop in front of their bungalow, at exactly minus two hours, twenty-one minutes, fifty-four seconds. The driver called out in Spanish. Dr. Richardson, Dr. Pitoff, are you ready? Yes, ready. We're coming. They both got to their feet, Richardson pulling himself up reluctantly. The older you get, the harder it is to leave a comfortable chair. He settled himself beside his colleague and former enemy, and the jeep started again, rolling between the buildings of the living quarters area and out onto the long, straight road across the pampas, toward the distant blaze of electric lights. He wondered why he had been thinking so much, lately, about the Auburn bomb. He'd questioned, at times, indignantly, of course, whether Russia had launched it. But it wasn't until tonight, until he had heard what Petoff had had to say, that he seriously doubted it. Petoff wouldn't lie about it, and Petoff would have been in position to have known the truth, if the missile had been launched from Russia. Then he stopped thinking about what was water, or blood, a long time over the dam. The special policeman at the entrance to the launching site reminded them that they were both smoking. When they extinguished, respectively, their cigarette and pipe, he waved the jeep on and went back to his argument with a carload of tourists who wanted to get a good view of the launching. "'There now, Lee. Do you need anything else to convince you that this isn't a weapon project?' Pitov asked. "'No. Now that you mention it, I don't. You know, I don't believe I've had to show an identity card the whole time I've been here.' I don't believe I have an identity card, Pitov said. Think of that. The lights blazed everywhere around them, but mostly about the rocket that towered above everything else, so thick that it seemed squat. The gantry cranes had been hauled away now, and it stood alone, but it was still wreathed in thick electric cables. They were pouring enough current into that thing to light half the street lights in Buenos Aires. When the cables were blown free by separation charges at the blast-off, the generators powered by the rocket engines had better be able to take over, because if the magnetic field collapsed and that fifty-kilo chunk of negative proton matter came in contact with natural positive proton matter, an old-fashioned H-bomb would be a firecracker to what would happen. Just one hundred kilos of pure two-hundred-proof MC-2. 
the driver took them around the rocket, dodging assorted trucks and mobile machinery that were being hurried out of the way. The countdown was just beyond two hours, five minutes. The jeep stopped at the edge of a crowd around three more trucks, and Dr. Eugenio Galvez, the director of the Institute, left the crowd and approached at an awkward half-run as they got down. "'Is everything checked, gentlemen?' he wanted to know. "'It was this afternoon at 1730,' Pitoff told him, "'and nobody's been burning my telephone to report anything different. Are the balloons and the drone planes ready?' "'The Air Force just finished checking. They're ready. Captain Nerquiola flew one of the planes over the course and made a guidance tape.' That's been duplicated, and all the planes are equipped with copies. "'How's the wind?' Richardson asked. "'Still steady. We won't have any trouble about fallout or with the balloons.' "'Then we better get back to the bunker and make sure everybody there is on the job.' The loudspeaker was counting down to two hours, one minute. "'Could you spare a few minutes to talk to the press?' Eugenio Galvez asked. And perhaps say a few words for telecast? This last is most important. We can't explain too many times the purpose of this experiment. There is still much hostility, arising from fear that we are testing a nuclear weapon. The press and telecast services were well represented. There were close to a hundred correspondents from all over South America, from South Africa and Australia, even one from Ceylon. They had three trucks, with mobile telecast pickups, and when they saw who was approaching, they released the two rocketry experts they had been quizzing and pounced on the new victims. "'Was there any possibility that negative proton matter might be used as a weapon?' "'Anything can be used as a weapon. You could stab a man to death with that lead pencil you're using,' Pitov replied. "'But I doubt if negamatter will ever be so used.' We're certainly not working on weapons design here. We started, six years ago, with the ability to produce negative protons, reverse spin neutrons, and positrons, and the theoretical possibility of assembling them into negamatter. We have just gotten a 50-kilogram mass of nega-iron assembled. In those six years, we had to invent all our techniques and design all our equipment. If we'd been insane enough to want to build a nuclear weapon after what we went through up north, we could have done so from memory and designed a better, which is to say a worse, one from memory in a few days. Yes, and building a negamatter bomb for military purposes would be like digging a fifty-foot shaft to get a rock to bash somebody's head in, when you could do the job better with the shovel you were digging with, Richardson added. The time, money, energy, and work we put in on this thing would be ample to construct twenty thermonuclear bombs, and that's only a small part of it. He went on to tell them about the magnetic bottle inside the rocket's warhead, mentioning how much electric current was needed to keep up the magnetic field that insulated the negamatter from contact with posimatter. Then what was the purpose of this experiment, Dr. Richardson? Oh, we were just trying to find out a few basic facts about natural structure. Long ago, it was realized that the nucleonic particles, protons, neutrons, mesons, and so forth, must have structure of their own. Since we started constructing negative proton matter, we found out a few things about nucleonic structure, some rather odd things, including fractions of Planck's constant. A couple of the correspondents, a man from La Prensa and an Australian whistled softly. The others looked blank. Pitov took over. "'You see, gentlemen, most of what we learned, we learned from putting negamatter atoms together. We annihilated a few of them. Over there, in that little concrete building, we have one of the most massive steel vaults in the world where we do that. But we assembled millions of them for every one we annihilated.' and that chunk of nega iron inside the magnetic bottle kept growing. And when you have a piece of nega matter you don't want, you can't just throw it out on the scrap pile. We might have rocketed it into escape velocity and let it blow up in space, away from the moon or any of the artificial satellites, but why waste it? 
so we're going to have the rocket ejected, and when it falls, we can see by our telemetered instruments just what happens. Well, won't it be annihilated by contact with atmosphere? somebody asked. That's one of the things we want to find out, Pitoff said. We estimate about 20% loss from contact with atmosphere, but the mass that actually lands on the target area should be about 40 kilos. It should be something of a spectacle coming down. You say you had to assemble it, after creating the negative protons and neutrons and the positrons. Doesn't any of this sort of matter exist in nature? The man who asked that knew better himself. He just wanted the answer on the record. Oh, no, not on this planet, and probably not in the galaxy. There may be whole galaxies composed of nothing but negamatter. There may even be isolated stars and planetary systems inside our galaxy composed of negamatter, though I think that very improbable. But when negamatter and posimatter come into contact with one another, the result is immediate mutual annihilation. They managed to get away from the press and returned as far as the bunkers, a mile and a half away. Before they went inside, Richardson glanced up at the sky, fixing the location of a few of the more conspicuous stars in his mind. There were almost a hundred men and women inside, each at his or her instruments, view screens, radar indicators, detection instruments of a dozen kinds. The reporters and telecast people arrived shortly afterward, and Eugenio Galvez took them in tow. While Richardson and Pitov were making their last-minute rounds, the countdown progressed past minus one hour, and at minus twenty minutes, all the overhead lights went off and the small instrument operator's lights came on. Pitov turned on a couple of view screens, one from a pickup on the roof of the bunker and another from the launching pad. They sat down, side by side, and waited. Richardson got his pipe out and began loading it. The loudspeaker was saying, Minus two minutes, one fifty-nine, fifty-eight, fifty-seven. He let his mind drift away from the test, back to the world that had been smashed around his ears in the autumn of 1969. He was doing that so often now when he should be thinking about Two seconds, one second, firing. It was a second later that his eyes focused on the left-hand view screen. Red and yellow flames were gushing out at the bottom of the rocket, and it was beginning to tremble. Then the upper jets, the ones that furnished power for the generators, began firing. He looked anxiously at the meters. The generators were building up power. Finally, when he was sure that the rocket would be blasting off anyhow, the separator charges fired and the heavy cables fell away. An instant later, the big missile started inching upward, gaining speed by the second, first slowly and jerkily, and then more rapidly until it passed out of the field of the pickup. He watched the rising spout of fire from the other screen until it passed from sight. By that time, Pitoff had twisted a dial and gotten another view on the left-hand screen, this time from close to the target. That camera was radar-controlled. It had fastened onto the approaching missile, which was still invisible. The stars swung slowly across the screen until Richardson recognized the ones he had spotted at the zenith. In a moment now, the rocket, a hundred miles overhead, would be nosing down, and then the warhead would open and the magnetic field inside would alter and the mass of negamatter would be ejected. The stars were blotted out by a sudden glow of light. Even at a hundred miles, there was enough atmospheric density to produce considerable energy release. Pitov, beside him, was muttering, partly in German and partly in Russian. Most of what Richardson caught was figures, trying to calculate how much of the mass of unnatural iron would get down for the ground blast. Then the right-hand screen broke into a wriggling orgy of color, and at the same time every scrap of radio-transmitted apparatus either went out or began reporting erratically. The left-hand screen, connected by wiring to the pickup on the roof, was still functioning. 
For a moment, Richardson wondered what was going on, and then shocked recognition drove that from his mind as he stared at the ever-brightening glare in the sky. It was the Auburn bomb again. He was back, in memory, to the night on the shore of Lake Ontario, the party breaking up in the early hours of morning, he and Janet and the people with whom they had been spending a vacation week standing on the lawn as the guests were getting into their cars. And then the sudden light in the sky, the cries of surprise, and then of alarm, as it seemed to be rushing straight down upon them. He and Janet clutching each other and staring up in terror at the falling blaze from which there seemed no escape. Then relief as it curved away from them and fell to the south. And then the explosion, lighting the whole southern sky. There was a similar explosion in the screen, when the mass of Nega Iron landed, a sheet of pure white light, so bright and so quick as to almost pass the limit of visibility. And then a moment's darkness, that was in his stunned eyes more than in the screen, and then the rising glow of updrawn incandescent dust. Before the sound waves had reached them, he had been legging it into the house. The television had been on, and it had been acting as insanely as the screen on his right now. He had called the state police, the telephones had been working all right, and told them who he was, and they had told him to stay put and they'd send a car for him. They did, within minutes. Janet and his host and hostess had waited with him on the lawn until it came, and after he had gotten into it, he had turned around and looked back through the rear window, and seen Janet standing under the front light, holding the little dog in her arms, flopping one of its silly little paws up and down with her hand to wave goodbye to him. He had seen her and the dog like that every day of his life, for the last fifteen years. "'What kind of radiation are you getting?' He could hear Alexis Pitoff asking into a phone. "'What? Nothing else? Oh, yes, of course. But mostly cosmic. That shouldn't last long.' He turned from the phone. "'A devil's own dose of cosmic and some gamma. It was the cosmic radiation that put the radios and telescreens out.' That's why I insisted that the drone planes be independent of radio control. They always got cosmic radiation from the micro-annihilations in the test vault. Well, now they had an idea of what produced natural cosmic rays. There must be quite a bit of negamatter and posimatter going into mutual annihilation and total energy release through the universe. Of course, there were no detectors set up in advance around Auburn, he said. We didn't really begin to find anything out for an hour. By that time, the cosmic radiation was over, and we weren't getting anything but gamma. What? What has Auburn to do? The Russian stopped short. You think this was the same thing? He gave it a moment's consideration. Lee, you're crazy! There wasn't an atom of artificial negamatter in the world in 1969. Nobody had made any before us. We gave each other some scientific surprises then, but nobody surprised both of us. You and I, between us, knew everything that was going on in nuclear physics in the world. And you know as well as I do. A voice came out of the public address speaker. Some of the radio equipment around the target area, that wasn't knocked out by blast, is beginning to function again. There is an increasingly heavy gamma radiation, but no more cosmic rays. They were all prompt radiation from the annihilation. The gamma is secondary effect. Wait a moment. Captain Urquiola of the Air Force says that the first drone plane is about to take off. It had been two hours after the blast that the first drones had gone over what had been Auburn, New York. He was trying to remember, as exactly as possible, what had been learned from them. Gamma radiation, a great deal of gamma. But it didn't last long. It had been almost down to a safe level by the time the investigation had been called off, and, 
two months after there had been no more missiles, and no way of producing more, and no targets to send them against if they'd had them, rather, he had been back at Auburn on his hopeless quest, and there had been almost no trace of radiation. Nothing but a wide, shallow crater, almost two hundred feet in diameter, and only fifteen at its deepest, already full of water, and a circle of flattened and scattered rubble for a mile and a half all around it. He was willing to bet anything that that was what they'd find where that chunk of nega iron had landed fifty miles away on the Pampas. Well, the first drone ought to be over the target area before long, and at least one of the balloons that had been sent up was reporting its course by radio. The radios in the others were silent, and the recording counters had probably jammed in all of them. There'd be something of interest when the first drone came back. He dragged his mind back to the present, and went to work with Alexis Pitov. They were at it all night, checking, evaluating, making sure that the masses of data that were coming in were being promptly processed for programming the computers. At each of the increasingly frequent coffee breaks, he noticed Pitov looking curiously. He said nothing, however, until long after dawn. They stood outside the bunker, waiting for the jeep that would take them back to their bungalow and watching the line of trucks. Argentine army engineers, locally hired laborers, load after load of prefab huts and equipment, going down toward the target area, where they would be working for the next week. "'Lee, were you serious?' Pitov asked. I mean, about this being like the one at Auburn. It was exactly like Auburn. Even that blazing light that came rushing down out of the sky. I wondered about that at the time. What kind of a missile would produce an effect like that? Now I know. We just launched one like it. But that's impossible! I told you! Between us, we know everything that was happening in nuclear physics then. Nobody in the world knew how to assemble atoms of negamatter and build them into masses. Nobody and nothing on this planet built that mass of negamatter. I doubt if it even came from this galaxy. But we didn't know that then. When that negamatter meteor fell... The only thing anybody could think of was that it had been a Soviet missile. If it had hit around Leningrad or Moscow or Kharkov, who would you have blamed it on? The End of The Answer by H. Beam Piper I hope you stuck with this story because, while it's a bit heady, it is amazing. Piper managed to present a logical tale with just enough science to make it plausible. What do you think? Was it a meteor or an alien attack? Piper published his first short story time and time again in 1947 in astounding science fiction. That story was adapted for the radio program Dimension X in 1951. Here's an interesting fact. Time and Time Again was the very first story ever played on Ron's Amazing Stories. Episode number one. How about that? It seems as though the whole country is talking about the great 1954. Listen to what C.W. DeCandre, a resort owner in Daytona, Florida, one of more than 420,000 delighted new Ford owners has to say about Ford station wagons. Our resort has had nothing but Ford station wagons, and I'm convinced that the new 50 model is the best of all. It has the real passenger car comfort, which is important to our guests, and when you take out the rear seats, you have the perfect hauling vehicle. Tell you something else. I think the 50 Ford station wagon has a certain air about it that the others just can't match. It's so easy to keep new looking, too. Just a wash now and then, and you'd think we'd bought a new one. Ford dealers hear praise like this every day. And they want you to get that fine Ford feel, too. They want you to stop in and test drive the Ford for 50. And while you're there, get the facts on Ford economy. You'll discover the new Ford is low in initial cost, 
high in resale value, thrifty on gas and oil, and inexpensive to maintain. Yes, first and last, the new Ford is designed to save you money. See it. Test drive it tomorrow. And we close this podcast with thanks to Karen, Richard, and Yvonne for sharing their stories this week. Coming up on Ron's Amazing Stories are more stories. You can help with that by sending yours in. We want to hear what you have for us. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, it's easy to do. Just head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you'll find all of the links you'll need. We are on Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many other services. Pick one and do leave some feedback about the show. It really does help us to grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.